Amen. Matthew chapter 17 and verse 20. It's a very familiar passage. All of you have, I'm sure, heard of it. But Jesus is talking to his disciples, and what we find here is that the disciples had not yet been able to experience the supernatural. They had seen Jesus do it, but they had never been able to on their own. And so they they tried and they failed. They come short. And so they came to Jesus and basically paraphrasing, they said, why can't we do what you do? You know, we see you've got all power and we believe you can do anything, but why can't we do that? And he had a very simple solution for them. He said, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if, everybody say if, little word, big, big meaning, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and then he says this, and nothing, say it with me, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Amen. What if that were true? Amen. I know it. I got it. It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. And I'm asking, what if it's true? We all know it's true. But what I'm getting at is, I was raised with this thing. My dad's been a preacher my whole life. There's 17 ordained preachers in my dad's side of the family alone. But that was true in the book. But is it true in me? What if nothing were impossible unto you. Philippians 4.13. I'm going to start it out. You finish it. I can do. Did, 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 you really, did you really just utter those words or did you really mean it? I can do. Amen. What if that were true too? Amen. I'm just going to preach my testimony today. Pastor has asked for that. And I'm going to title it, What If? What if? What if? Come on, somebody just let your faith let your faith go and talk to God right now. Hallelujah, God, I, I need this. I need you to speak into my life right now. God, I want, I want to know more about you, God. Increase my faith, God. Let me be pleasing to you in my life, oh Jesus. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, I was able this week to hold our newborn grandson. His name is Bo, and he, he's perfect. He's just as perfect as can be, but, you know, he only sleeps. He doesn't really, he doesn't get up and talk, and, and he, he doesn't help pop uh, unload the car when I go to the grocery store. He he don't help me with all my suitcases. We live in suitcases. My my wife and I haven't had a home for five years. We live in suitcases on the road, and so basically, Bo is just kind of useless. You know, he 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 don't do much. You know, but I love him. I love him. I die for him. But holding him, especially last night, I got thinking about it, looking at looking at him. He would just look into my eyes, and, and, and I was looking into his, and, and I had the realization of purity. I'm, I'm holding purity, right? I mean, he, he's just pure. And, and if you follow that progression and, and you ask, why is he pure? I mean, because he is a person. He's a human. But why is he pure? And the reason is, is because he hasn't lived long enough to lose that purity. He hasn't had experiences in life. He, he hasn't made observations in life. And he, he hasn't gained much knowledge in life. And Eve in the Garden of Eden, felt that she needed something. She, she felt like, I, I need to know more. But what, what she didn't realize was she already had it all. She had everything. She, 
She had paradise. She had a personal and responsive God who was the creator of all things. She had everything she could ever want. Can you imagine your professor, well, your kindergarten all the way to professor, is God, the God of the universe. You want to know about physics? He can tell you. You want to know about mechanical engineering? He can tell you. You want to know math? He can tell you. You want to know, you want to know anything? He can tell you, but you see what she wanted was she wanted knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord had told them, he said, you know, here is paradise. I've made it for you. And God does all things well. And he told them, he said, now your job is to to, to watch over this, this whole place. In fact, the earth has been given to you. You now have dominion, and so you are supposed to tend to the garden. You are supposed to manage the garden. Now, now uh, God didn't tell Adam, don't touch of the, the tree, right? The, the serpent said, he changed it. He said, don't touch. That's not what God said. God said, manage it. It's all your job. But he said, he said, just don't eat of it. And so what we find with the tree of knowledge of good and evil was that God said, just don't internalize it. You have to know how to manage it. You have to know how to tend to it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore good and evil. Don't be ignorant of what's going on in the world because, you know, stuff happens in the world. And, and, and as you live, you walk out these doors, you're going to see some things. And you might even have a flat tire on your way home. There, there are things that happen to you. But what you need to know is don't internalize it. The disciples, they came to Jesus and they said, why can't we enter into the supernatural? We want to see a miracle, not just you, but we want to see it through us. And Jesus said, because of your unbelief, or another version says, your lack of faith. And then he said, if you, everybody say you, meaning me, will speak to that mountain. When I was a kid growing up, one of you kids sitting there on the front row, I used to think that verse meant that I could go to, say, Mount Rainier or Mount Shasta or Mount Everest. And if I had enough faith, I could make that mountain move. And another version says it'll throw into the sea. I was like, I'd love to see that. How many of you would love to throw a mountain into the ocean? I'd surf that wave. That's not what he's talking about. What's he talking about? He said, because of your unbelief, he said, that is your mountain. That is your mountain. And another place, Jesus is talking. He loved to talk with children sitting on, on his knee or children gathered around him. And I believe that it grounded him because he said, unless you be converted, <clears throat> converted means you turn around. huh? Converted means you're going this way, but you just turn around. He said, unless you be converted and become as one of these, my little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus didn't preach this plan of salvation. He gave the keys to Peter in Acts chapter 2 in verse 38. Peter stood up with the keys and he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of salvation. But the mentality of salvation is you've got to be converted and be as a child. And so when you look at that and you say, God, I have spent a lot of energy, a lot of time. I've gone to school. I've read a lot of books. I've learned a lot of things. Are you telling me there is no value in that? And the Lord would say, no, don't be ignorant. You've got to learn things. There ain't nothing wrong with school. But don't internalize it. 
When God created Adam and Eve, he breathed into them the breath of life. That's what's supposed to be inside of us. Hallelujah. When you take what's in the world and you lose what God put in you, which is his spirit, and you replace it with all the junk, it don't matter, good, bad, whatever. It doesn't matter, just things that happen in life. You begin to crowd out. There's no room for the Spirit of God anymore. And as you live, good and evil begin to pile up inside of you. Man, I've learned some things in life. When I was a baby, I didn't know anything about cancer. I know a lot about it now. I've learned a lot. I've seen a lot. You know, not everything you learn in life helps you. But sometimes you can't, you don't have any choice. You're going to learn anyway, right? Things happen. It rains on the the just and the unjust. It, It happens. And so I began to learn some things in life. And as I began to learn, I lost something. What I lost is, you know what a child has? A child don't have knowledge. They don't have experience. They, they, they don't have a lot of logical processes going on inside their head. But do you know what they have? They have an imagination. You can stand there in front of a little child. We've got a two-year-old grandson, too. I can stand there in front of him, and I'm convinced. I can tell that little two-year-old anything I want, and he'll believe it. And the reason is, is not because, now we're not, pr- we're not playing upon his ignorance. What we're talking about, we're magnifying his imagination. The fact that he is able to believe, and we're not, because we've seen things. Huh? I've seen things. And I looked at my little grandson and I said, man, I, I wish I could, I, I, w- I wish I could just wipe it away sometimes. I, I wish I could clear my, I, I, I've, I've been p- betrayed. I've had leaders betray me. I've had men of God betray me. I've had people in church that I pastored, that I gave my life to, to stab me in the back. I wish I could forget that stuff. But I can't. But what I got to do is I got to be converted and be as a child again. And so what do you do? If, if, if you want to be converted and be as a child, that doesn't mean that you get short again. That doesn't mean that all you want to do is eat chicken nuggets and french fries again. Somebody says, well, I must be a child. That doesn't mean that you don't know anything anymore. That No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you don't lose your sense of wonder. That you don't come into the presence of God and look around and say, hey, anything could happen. Oh, yeah, he's the God of the universe. Praise God. It means that when you read the book, you actually believe it could happen. Hallelujah. I'm tired of reading the book with a grown-up mind and saying the Red Sea only parted back then. Why can't God do it today? Come on, you're a little bit too grown up in here. Somebody needs to be converted and get your sense of wonder again. We still serve the same God that parted the Red Sea. He raises the dead. We always think that what we need is more knowledge. Man, I'd, I'd teach a Bible study if only I knew more about whatever. Huh? We limit ourselves because we think we need more when Jesus is telling his disciples, you actually need less. What they had in the Garden of Eden was they had God, but Eve said, I'm going to internalize knowledge of good and evil, and they lost their connection with God because they added the world's way of thinking, the world's 
knowledge, the world's logic. Okay, can I, can I just be real with you guys? I lost my ability to fake it when I was in a hospital and they said, it's over. I'm like, you know what, why, 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 why are we going to sit here and just fool one another and play games and play church and get up here and just try to look good, try to impress somebody? I didn't know nothing about cancer till my mother and my, my father-in-law, they called us one day. It was a Sunday. He was a great man of God. They were all stirred up because after church Sunday morning, he went home and he was hanging his trousers up in his closet, just hanging them up, literally just doing this, and that arm broke. It just broke. The bone broke. It cracked loud. She, my mother-in-law could hear it in the other room. She come in, and he's in horrible pain. She's like, what happened? He said, and his arm's just dangling. My arm broke. What'd you do, fall? No, it's hanging up my pants. The doctor said it's multiple myeloma. There's been a tumor eating away at that bone. They said, now that now we know why you'd had that anemia and all those issues that we just couldn't figure out what was going on. It was this. They said, you got six months to live. Man, we went to prayer. I learned some stuff. <laughs> I've seen some things in my life. I've seen good and I've seen evil. Four and a half years. It, it wasn't six months. It was four and a half years. He never missed a day of work. He was a contractor. But he finally, on a Tuesday, breathed his last. I'm telling you, my, mom, my wife was lost. She's a, she's a daddy's girl. She's like, this ain't supposed to happen to people like him. He's a man of God. He built... He built the church out in Stockton, California with Brother Haney. He was the contractor that built that. He was his partner in business, and he was always the head usher everywhere he was. He was, he was a pastor's friend. Why is, that, why is that criminal? 70 years old and healthy, and my dad dies at 56, and he's a man of God. It was an experience. You live a little, you're going to have some of these. And so my wife, she, she was lost for a period of time. And I'm not talking lost in sin, but just she didn't know where she was. She had no spatial uh, awareness. She would show up at the church and, and people in the church would come to me and they'd knock on my office door and they'd say, Sister Brenda's out in the parking lot. I go out there. She's out there. She's just looking, st staring straight into space i'd knock on the window what are you doing here she said i have no idea why how i'm here i don't even remember driving here it was like that because sometimes life just comes at you and you're not a child anymore and you lose your innocence and you begin to experience things and that's where some people leave god <laughs> They internalize that new knowledge that they just got. And they, they don't have Solomon's mother said, with all this knowledge, you better have wisdom. You better know what to do with it. Because all this knowledge, you can go to college, you can learn a lot of things, you can lose your soul because you don't have wisdom. You don't know what to do with this knowledge you're learning. A few years later, her dad, her mom got cancer. And uh, we prayed. You know, we prayed different because we had knowledge. Life will change you. But don't forget to be converted. And we prayed, and, 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 and we prayed. And I'll tell you, my, my wife and I, we, we, we had some other experiences I won't even go into. I don't have time. But we had a lot of attacks that came against us, a lot of unfair things that happened to us. And we got to the point where we had some serious talks with God, just like Job had. 
just like the prophets had. Why is there so much evil in the world? Why aren't you doing anything about this? You know, just human, right? And we prayed. But you know, Mama, Mama Mabry didn't want to stay around. She missed her husband. And so the doctor, it was reversed. The doctor said with Ken, you got six months. He lived four and a half years. But with her, the doctor said, oh, you've got an easy, you know, two to four years. She was gone in six months. And at the end of that, my wife and I decided, what are we going to do with this? How are we going to manage this knowledge of good and evil that has come into our life? you got to tend to it. huh? You've been given dominion over your world. What are you going to do with it? He said you tend to the garden. Every tree is your responsibility. In life, you can't ignore the bad. But you got better know how to manage it. And we went on a journey. How are we going to have faith? I still believe this is true. But I've seen some stuff. Am I being real with you right now? We got young people who leave church because they don't know how to manage the knowledge that they gain after they get out of here. Because in this church, they hear all this. They hear all the word, the word, the word. Then they go out there and they start getting some knowledge of good and evil. Life starts happening. And they don't see. They're not able to manage it. And they think there's a conflict. There is no conflict. It's just two different worlds. And so it was, a fri- it was a Friday night. My wife and I had, had dinner. I love my wife. We have dates. We've been married 30. Uh, she's not here, so I don't know how many years. 32 years. Don't tell nobody. Everything was great. Saturday morning, we woke up. My wife looked at me with shock. She said, Jeff, what is that? I, was, I had no idea what she's talking about. She pointed here. I touched here, and there was a knot, like a large lump. Overnight, it had appeared, and it was hard. It was like a goose egg under there. We went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, good news. You know, whenever a lump shows up, everybody thinks cancer. He said, it can't be cancer. Cancer don't grow overnight. He was wrong. The biopsy came back. He called me. Ear, nose, and throat doctor. He said, well, you won't be seeing me anymore. He said, you'd better go find somebody that knows something about this rare cancer you've got. And I said, what do you mean? He said, yeah, it's it's some kind of lymphoma, but it's rare. It's called mantle cell. He hung up, never talked to him again. Now what? Now what? I got knowledge. I've got experience. You know what? You don't, you don't get faith. You don't get faith when everything's good. Where you find your faith is in a storm. It's in the valley. huh? You find your faith when there is no hope. That's faith. You see, because if you don't need it, because your life is good, You can call it faith. You can show up here and sit on a church pew, and you can wave your hands, sing your songs. I've got faith. But it's when you go through something. And what I was beginning to realize was I had been raised in church, but I had too much of the world in me. I had too much of the the good and evil outside, and I had internalized it, and it was being exposed in this moment. So we were living on Maui, Hawaii at the time, pastoring a church, and the doctor there said, get off this island as fast as you can. Nobody here knows what to do with this disease. And so God led us. That's the interesting thing. Whenever you go through these journeys, I don't care how dark 
You know what you find? You find like Psalms 23. Thou art with me. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you gain an awareness that he's with you. And so, God led us to Washington, D.C., to the National Institutes of Health. The National Cancer Institute is one of their institutes there. And they were accepting uh, patients that had this particular type of cancer. And they said, we want to study you. It's rare. So in the study, they go all over the world. I don't care where you live in the world, what, pop, what nationality. They'll get you. They'll recruit you. There were only 66 in the study. And I was the youngest. And by the time they got me, the scans revealed that it was stage four, that tumors were everywhere, that my intestines were full of tumor. That explained a lot. All the headaches and everything, that, that explained a lot. They were bulging out at my neck. There were, there were tumors everywhere. My spleen was twice its size. My bone marrow was 70% cancer. And our doctors were the experts. Dr. Wyndham Wilson, look him up. He's Mr. Lymphoma. Nobody knows more about lymphoma on planet Earth than Dr. Wyndham Wilson. There's 68 known lymphomas. That one doctor by himself with his team has come up with the identification, the protocol, and the name of 63 of the 68 known lymphomas. And when we came to him, he said, if you sign on the dotted line, we will spare no expense. We will do everything new that science has to offer. But at the end of this study, we believe that you will benefit science more than science will benefit you. Do you know what an expert is? An expert is just somebody that knows more than anybody else around here. But God ain't from around here. They're practicing physicians. And let me just tell you, I admire doctors. They study hard. They're smart people. I love science. I'm actually a nerd. I get into science. I love it. Nurses are my heroes. But at the end of the day, you have to re don't internalize that. Hallelujah. The only thing you internalize is God. And so they invited us into the study, and they said it's going to get bad quick, and it did. They said, you're the youngest in our study by a good bit. Most everybody else is 70, 80, and even 90. This is a gut disease. Once it sets up in the gut, it's called the silent killer. And once we find it, it's usually too late. And, and we don't have much time. So what we have to do is hit you with the hardest chemotherapy we can. And they did. It was seven different chemo drugs at the same time. I got very sick. I, went, I lost 70 pounds. Uh, er, every side effect that could come did come. It was, it was a crash. It was everything a crash. It was a financial crash. We were pastoring in Maui, Hawaii. We were in between assistants. I didn't have an assistant, didn't even have a youth pastor at the time. And we left the church. And you're wondering, my whole life is falling apart. You know, the church doesn't have leadership. And, and what's going to happen there? And I've got an 18-year-old daughter that moved into the hood in Alexandria, Louisiana. And there's people being shot out in front of her, her, her door and I can't help her. She called me, Dad, I've, I just got in a wreck. I'm on the highway and I'm in ICU and I'm saying I'm powerless to help you. There were every, everything that was going wrong could go wrong and I'm in this situation and I'm burdened down with a lot of knowledge. I've got a lot of information. I've got so much experience and pain is a teacher. And I'm in agony. During the third cycle of chemotherapy, my colon ruptured. Went into emergency surgery. I came out with an ostomy bag. It cut 30 inches of my colon out because it was just totally destroyed with disease. I'm in that hospital nine months at one stretch. Got to go home. Listen, three nights I slept in my own bed out of nine months. And my wife, my dear wife, Never left my side. She slept on chairs, not even as comfortable as these, for months on end. And we're in that situation, and we're in a battle. 
Because the battle is not the cancer. The battle is not in your body. The battle is not in your marriage. The battle is not in your finances. The battle is in your mind. Because Jesus said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, what is it? That mountain of knowledge, that mountain of experience that has piled up and has created an impossible barrier of doubt between you and the supernatural. They gave me a bone marrow transplant. Months of chemotherapy. Three surgeries. Everything they could do. I just, I was now, I was no longer a husband in effect. I was no longer a father in effect. I was no longer a pastor in effect. I was just a patient laying in a bed. That was my new Normal. And here I am in this situation, and I'm beginning to wonder. God, all them dreams that you gave me, was that just for, was was that just a cruel joke? The destiny that I know that I carry, was that an illusion? Was that fake news? And I had to crawl up inside my head and begin to deal with the knowledge. Do you know John the Baptist, Jesus said, was the greatest man ever born of woman? The greatest. The greatest. He introduced Jesus into the world. Here he is. Everybody follow him. All my followers, he had a huge following. He said, don't follow me no more. Follow him. He was the forerunner. But at the end of his life, what did he do? John the Baptist had to deal with some stuff. Because he he had some of his disciples and he was in prison. And Herod's horrible wife wanted to kill this man. Can you imagine it was the ultimate story of good versus evil? And evil was winning. And he's in that situation, and you know he'd prayed. You know he'd said, spring me from this place, oh God. You know he'd said, God, I don't deserve to be in this this dungeon. And he got to the point, he said, go, go find Jesus. I got a question. You'll get some questions if you live long enough. He said, go ask him, are are you the one or should we look for another? What he was saying is, based on my circumstance, I got a question for you. Because I look around, you ain't here. (laughs) So should we keep looking? You know what Jesus did? His answer is very instructive for you and I. How many of you want to make it all the way? Amen. Of course you do. Let me tell you what he did will help you. Jesus did not say, all right, open sesame. Let him out. Make everything good, right? Make everything just easy for him. He he suffered long enough. Give him an easy life now. You know what he said? He said, go tell John. The things that I do. I heal the sick. I raise the dead. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed. He said, just go tell him because it was happening. It was happening all over. And they went back and they told John. And do you know what that was doing for John? That was handing John a shovel. It's time to get busy on that mountain. It's piled up. It's piled up. You've seen some things when that door, when that jail cell locked, there was some doubt that piled up. And what you've got to do is every single day, you got to tend to the knowledge of good and evil. It don't matter what happens in your life. You got to, you got to tend to, and you got to realize, you got to realize this is not my home. 
I'm just a passing through. This is temporary. It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what happens to me. God is still God. God is still able. God is still on the throne. God still has all power in heaven and in earth. Miracles still happen. Okay, but I I didn't know. I didn't know how to speak to that mountain. I'd never been there. I had friends who were pastors call me up. They hadn't called me for a while, and they admitted why. We don't know what to say. We've never been where you are. I didn't know what to say either, so I didn't feel bad for them. I know how to live when everything's good. You just get on automatic pilot, right? You just get up in the morning, you brush your teeth. It's just automatic what you do when everything's good. But you need strategy in life when stuff starts coming against you. You better have some skills in living in order to overcome all of the junk that can happen to you. So I told Brenda, you and I, we got to have a meeting. I, I, I wasn't thinking in terms of this scripture. I wasn't thinking in, in, in terms of like, I'm going to preach a message about this one day. I'm just, I'm just a, a guy just trying to get through this. And I didn't know what to say. So Brandon said, well, well, you want to have a meeting? Well, why don't we just meet? We're always together. (laughs) I said, yeah, I know that's true, but I was beginning to think of life in this big picture. And I began to realize that, that we live days, but we don't have many moments. And we have even fewer landmarks. And I realized in this situation, I needed to create a moment that was a landmark. But I didn't know what to do. If only I'd remembered what I'd been taught my whole life that was in the Bible, where Jesus said, you've got to start speaking that mountain. But here's what I did. We stood there that day, and I was so weak, I had 62 staples in my abdomen. I could hardly stand straight. I looked at my wife, and here's what came out. I said, what if the doctors are wrong? Oh, man, was that ever. I am in the NIH. I am in the National Cancer Institute with Dr. Wyndham Wilson, and my life is winding down according to him. My wife had already said goodbye to me one time. She already thought, it's over. You've been a good husband. I was saying goodbye to her. Life was leaving me, but I just wouldn't die. Don't give up before God does. Don't quit before God throws in the towel. And I want you to know that my God is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is not going to throw in the towel. I said, what if the doctors are wrong? What if the best is yet to come? What if we will see the million soul revival in the Philippines? What if we're going to live our dreams? Hallelujah. What if I'm going to get a new anointing? I just started saying a whole bunch of what if. And you know that's what I needed. Because I was trying to have faith without having what faith is made of. Do you know what faith is made of? Anybody? Anybody know what faith is made of? It says it in the book. Where uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of Hope for the evidence of things not seen. Okay, so my answer is not everything I have seen. It's something I hadn't seen yet. I haven't seen this before. I haven't seen this hype before. I haven't seen a miracle like this before. Hallelujah. But I've got to have hope. 
I've got to have hope. I had lost hope. I still had faith. But I began to think, maybe I'm just the Christian soldier that just has to die with my faith. Listen, that's a testimony. But don't write the end of your story. Let him do it. What if he don't want you to die with that? Yeah, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I'm human too. I've got the same knowledge and information and experience you do. Oh, but I've seen somebody. Oh, I've seen what happened in their life. Come on, somebody. You got to move that out of the way. My God is still sitting. Hallelujah. He's tapping his foot on the circle of the earth. Hallelujah. Up in heaven, there are angels that are circling the throne. And day and night, they're saying, holy, holy, holy. Come on. Glory to God. I told Brenda, I said, if I don't have to die in this hospital, I'm going to make some changes. I'm not going to waste this time of suffering. I'm not just going to be that guy that belly aches and has a pity party and is negative and critical all the time. No, I'm going to get something out of this. I said, if I don't have to die in this hospital, I will no longer allow fear to stop me from walking through a door God opens. Listen, you guys don't know me, but just a few years ago, I'm the shy guy. I don't take chances. I, I'm not that guy that likes to be up front. I, I love to be in the background and help somebody. That's me. That's my ministry. And it's not because God called me to that. It's because my fear always stopped me from doing anything else. And here I am. My life is about gone, they say. And I realize how precious it is. I realize that I actually have something to contribute. And if I don't have to die, I ain't letting fear stop me. I don't care what it is. That's a word for somebody in here. Don't waste your life on fear. You know what? Fear is our friend. God gave it to us. Because if there's danger, like your life is in danger, fear helps you run really fast. You will break your previous speed record if a bear is chasing you. Right? It protects you from danger. But, but what if there is no danger, but there is still fear? That's what the devil uses. He'll lie to you. He'll say, oh, it's dangerous for you to get up and testify in church because you're going to look, you're going to look dumb or, or, or you're going to say things that don't make sense. He's going to tell you it's dangerous for you. I want you to know that whenever God opens a door, there is no danger. There is only purpose. You know what? Okay, hope you can be seated. I'm going to try to wrap it up here. Do you know that hope, listen, hope. <laughs> okay, so one day you're going to build a building. You're going to build a church building here. God's going to give you a property. You're going to build a church building. And when you do, hey, somebody needs to say amen. It's going to happen. Don't tell me you've lived so long that you lost your imagination. We don't need people that come in here and bring your baggage from the past and say it ain't possible because we tried and it didn't happen. You need to be like a child again. You need to go through a conversion process and say God is able. Wow. I want you to know that two things just happened right now. Number one, you got a word from God. And number two, knowledge rose up. Your enemy is not your finances. 
Your enemy is in your mind. You're able to do more than you think you can. But you got to get out of your own way. Jesus said, because of your unbelief, because if you would say to that mountain, somebody's got to get busy talking to your mountain. Jesus did not say, Jesus did not say, your pastor will speak to your mountain. (laughs) Jesus did not say that he will move your mountain. I know we sing a song that there ain't no mountain he can't move, and I believe that's true, but there's certain mountains he won't move because it's your job. Your doubt is your responsibility. If you have a hard time seeing the miracle, what I mean by that is visualizing it. When I said, when I said you're going to build a building, every single one of you in this place should have been able to close your eyes and see a building. You should have been able to see about 300 parking spaces. Concrete with street lights, landscaped. You got a little lighthouse. You need a lighthouse that's 100 feet high. Do you see what we're doing here? We're trying to be more childlike. I see it. I see it. I see it. I see it. But when that happens, you're going to go get a contractor. I know it. God, God, will give you, God will give you grace. Amen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You're going to go to a contractor. You're going to show them a blueprint. You're going to say, this is my vision. It's on paper now. This vision has been in my heart for a long time, but this vision is finally down on paper And that contractor is going to look at it. He's going to say, either he can or he can't. If he's good, he'll say, yeah, I can build that. Yes, I can bring your dream into this world. But he ain't telling the whole truth because I don't care how good that contractor is. That contractor don't have drywall in his back pocket. He don't have carpet on his shoulder. He ain't carrying windows and doors and paint and he's not carrying concrete and all that. But the contractor is saying, I can build that because he knows where to get the substance. And so he goes to Lowe's or Home Depot and he builds your dream. Faith is your contractor if you want a miracle. How many of you realize that faith works? But faith is like that contractor. When you say, faith, I need a miracle. Faith says, yeah, I'm, I, you came to the right place. I'm the one. But he has to go to your Hope Depot to see what have you been hoping. Have you been spending your days, Hannah, Hoping for a baby? Have you been crying out to God? Oh, I hope one day I'm going to hold a baby. Hallelujah. And the expert said, your womb is barren. But hallelujah, I can still hope anyway. And when I close my eyes, it's like I'm holding that child. Praise God. I want you to know that you've got to learn how to hope in any circumstance. Hope, hope and the uh, hope and fear are the exact same thing. They are functions of your imagination. But fear is, oh, tomorrow might be worse than today. You don't know. You don't know tomorrow. But fear will 
grab your imagination and it'll run that, run that direction. But hope is different. You get up in the morning, you still don't know. But if you have hope, you grab hold of the steering wheel of your mind, your imagination, and you turn it. Hey, wait a minute. I know that God is for me. I know that my God wants good things for me. Hallelujah. I don't care what kind of things you've seen in your life, in your past. I don't care, Hannah, how many times that you have felt that you're going to have a baby and you still don't. You can still hope. And you grab a hold of your mind and you turn it towards good. Maybe tomorrow's good. Maybe today's going to be better than yesterday. Okay, wrap it up. It got worse. After I had that declaration with my wife, my body got worse. But my kids would call me, Dad, how's it going? And they, I knew what they were saying. They were wanting to know. They want me to stick around. So they were talking about my body. And I'd tell them, the doctor said this, this, and this. It ain't looking good. But then I would say, but let me tell you how I'm doing. Because my body ain't me. This old body's going to wear out one day. But I'm not my body. I have never been closer to God in my life. I have never seen revelations in the word of God like I do now. I have never felt his presence like I do now. I am better than I've ever been in my life. <clears throat> well, the doctors gave up after two years. <laughs> after two years in a hospital, far from home. They said, it's over. We've tried everything. Everything. And I know they had because I was there when they did it. They said, there's a tumor on your liver at the bile duct. If it grows any more, that, that liver stops functioning. You've got three to five days. It's over. They said it could happen within three to five days. They said, this is, your, this is your gift. Treat these three to five days as your gift to get everything right in your world. Well, I've been at the edge of death for months, so I had everything right. They said, go home. Go forgive people who did you wrong. Go ask forgiveness of people you've done wrong. Get it right. That's a good thing for everybody. Treat every day like it's your last but I told Brenda, I said, we're not going home. I said, we're going to church. Logic, logic would assemble all of my experience. What I saw happen to mom, Mabry. What I saw happen to dad, Mabry. What I've seen happen to other people and collect it. And logic will spit out an answer. I know that. Unless you be converted. It's the mentality of the kingdom. You got to be this way. Speak to that mountain. You know what? I know this man of God is a great preacher, but he's preached so many messages. At some point, you got to realize that I've got to speak to that mountain myself. Sometime the word that you need won't come to you. It will come through you. And someday you've got to get tired of being weak. And you've got to get fed up. And you've got to start looking at that mountain and saying, Mountain, I am going to be a man of faith. I am going to have hope. Today, I'm going to have hope. You're not taking my hope from me. So we went to church anyway because you don't have to. 
For we walk by faith and not by observation, knowledge, experience, sight. You know what? People who have great faith in God, it's not that they're ignorant of the world. We live in the same world as everybody else. But we've just decided. God's in me, not the world. This all happens around me. I am in the world, but not of the world. And so we went to church. And my logic said, you've been to church. You still have cancer. Your mother-in-law went to church. She had cancer. Your dad went to church. Had I'm just being real with you. Can I be real with you? And I said, yeah, that's true. But that's where I'm going to get my miracle. Hallelujah. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things. We went to church. It was the first day of a revival. Hallelujah. It was a big old church that let me sit on the platform, kind of like a make a wish thing. Well, it's over. Let them sit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, but they did let me sit on the platform. And I'm standing up there. I'm so weak. And the doctors, the experts, all of them had just said it's over. After a long illness. When everything they said was going to happen came to pass. But what if they're wrong? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know what's been spoken over this church. I'm here for the first time. But there have been some words spoken over, over you that have torn you down. It is time for you to become the exact opposite of those words. It's time for somebody to find inside of you. Hallelujah. Something that you have never seen. This, I want you to know God has something prepared for this church. That none of you have seen. Not even in your dreams. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can even ask or think. Come on, somebody clap your hand. We got to break through something here right now. Come on, clap your hands. <clears throat> Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Let Souls Harbor be a place of dreams and vision. Let release the imagination in this place. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. Something's being birthed in this place. Don't miss your opportunity.